Last winter, Eric Lathwaite built a model of a new invention out of his boyhood Meccano set. The invention had taken him 20 years to develop. When he first proposed it, he was at the height of his career and perhaps the most celebrated engineer in Britain. Until tonight, it's been seen only by a small band of sympathizers. I've been involved in making some pretty unusual machines in my time, but even on those standards, this is a very unusual device indeed. It's a new form of propulsion that the establishment said couldn't possibly work. This is a model of something which we have now established as a possible drive even for space vehicles, but nevertheless, as far as the establishment is concerned, this is heresy. <laughs> Gyroscopes have always fascinated me. Of course, they're to do essentially with things that spin. And I think things that spin are magic, whether it be spinning electrons, spinning planets, or spinning galaxies. Sometimes I think spin is all there is. I think matter itself is nothing but spin. Certainly, with this gyroscope, I hope to develop an entirely new propulsion system. become a new form of propulsion has sounded to most of Lathwaite's colleagues like the fantasy of a child, not an engineer. When you first see a gyroscope, it looks magical. And for some reason, he seems to have taken this childlike impression of the gyroscope. He thought it was something strange and mysterious. And if you are an innovator, as he is, the strange and mysterious have a great attraction. And he followed that and he followed it too far. There you go. But for some engineers, he's a hero. Eric Lathwaite is one of the giants of electrical machine developments in the 20th century. He's a man with intense curiosity about all technical matters, uh, a burning desire to find out how things work, how things operate. He also has a desire to communicate his ideas and share his enthusiasm you get the impression that it's trying to get a grip on this magnetic flux. Nathwaite seems always to have had an enthusiasm for the strange and magical. That's going nicely. The linear electric motor is a very simple idea. It's just an ordinary electric motor which has been unrolled. And will produce a force... He's best known as the developer of the linear motor. We put the aluminium plate on the surface and switch on. And the effect of the force is now quite obvious. In the 60s, as a young professor at Imperial College, Lathwaite developed scores of applications for the linear motor. In the 70s, one was used to power a British experimental high-speed train. helped develop a full-scale test vehicle combining the latest hovercraft and linear motor technology. But one day, he suddenly got bad news. The track hovercraft company is at present in, in jeopardy, uh, and it stands a, a chance of stopping just for lack of funds. And stop it did, when the British government pulled out. But Lathwaite wasn't beaten. Switch on! He immediately proposed an even better idea for a high-speed train. Now, you see that supported height is now about six inches. And six inches is more 
than the height you would need to suspend the high-speed train. He made a linear motor levitate by electromagnetism. We've designed the motor to propel it, which gives you the lift and guidance for nothing. Literally for nothing, for no additional equipment and for no additional power input. This is beyond my wildest dreams that I should ever see that sort of thing occur. Maglev has shown up well under test at the Railway Technical Centre. It has but in Britain, Lathwaite's visionary idea was only half-heartedly developed and then dropped. With all this going for only to be taken up by the Japanese and Germans. It was the final disappointment. The cancellation was a terrible blow to him. He saw the major project work he had been engaged in for years, which had been building up gradually but steadily, making progress and seeming to be leading to something quite outstanding. He saw this all vanish disappear almost overnight when the project was cancelled and it was a terrible blow for him. Electromagnetism is for me the nearest thing we have to sheer magic. Two different directions of motion with one and the same set of coils. But ironically for the public, Lathwaite was rapidly becoming an engineering superstar. He tried hard to be as enthusiastic about linear motors as before, but he now knew it was a technology that in Britain had been unfulfilled. I've got another model. He'd reached a dead end. But his life was about to be changed forever. day, this man phoned Lathwaite to say he had a remarkable new invention. Lathwaite invited him to Imperial College. An amateur inventor, Alex Jones, had brought Lathwaite a crude device which he said broke the laws of physics. Other scientists of Lathwaite's eminence might well have dismissed him as a crank, but Lathwaite was curious. Jones's device consisted of a weight hinged to an upright stand mounted on wheels. Just swinging the weight from side to side, said Jones, would propel the device a few feet forward, with no drive to the wheels, no external thrust. Lathwaite knew that was impossible, but Jones told him it wasn't if the weight was a spinning gyroscope. Lathwaite vividly recalls his reaction. When Alex switched his machine on, it was quite disturbing to one's upbringing. The gyroscope appeared to be producing a force without a reaction. When you see something like that, you say, well, that shouldn't happen. And, and once you see something like that, then you hope, don't you, you just got to find out. I thought I'd seen something that was impossible. Like everyone else, I'm brought up on Newton's laws of motion. The third law is supposed to have said, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Therefore, you cannot propel a body outside its own dimensions. This thing apparently did. So Lathwaite immediately set about investigating more impossible things a gyroscope might do. I started to do experiments of my own. One of them was to make rather large spinning tops with most of their mass in the rim of the wheel. And these very really definitely did something that looked impossible. And by 1973, uh, Sir George Porter asked me if I'd do a discourse at the Royal Institution. The Royal Institution is one of Britain's most august centres of scientific learning. a long tradition of inviting some of the nation's leading scientists to give a discourse about their work. The great scientist Faraday himself had been a frequent lecturer, but such was Lathwaite's standing that he too had been asked more than once to follow in his footsteps and address the cream of Britain's scientific establishment. I've given a number of Lathwaite decided to discuss his new research on gyroscopes. I was very excited about it because I knew I had something to show them that was startling. And I did it rather in the spirit of 
come and look what I've discovered. Come and share this with Even me. My closest friend. And it was only afterwards I realised that nobody wanted to share it with me. Well, tonight one of the two... His mistake was to appear to challenge the very foundations of science, even Newton himself. A gyroscope is a curious device in which conventional physics seems to go out of the window. Now, first of all, we spin up the wheel, and it's then what I call live, as opposed to when it's not spinning, dead. So what I'm going to do is to hang this large weight on, and then as it's rotating, hang on the weight, it recesses, it has angular momentum about the vertical, we catch the weight next time round, hop, and the angular momentum just simply disappears, it seems to evaporate. It makes you question the validity of the Newton's third law. Action and reaction are equal and opposite. And this is another experiment that appears to defy conventional physics. And you see, this is not doing what the physics book says it should, because the mass centre is certainly not the centre of rotation. And that's not what is supposed to happen. He only learned afterwards how his audience were taking it all. Go away. There were several things in the lecture that were pure heresy. It won't go away. That is a ridiculous thing to see. To say that an object can rotate in a circle and not produce the full amount of centrifugal force, the man's obviously a lunatic. And the second thing was lifting the big wheel. How do you manage to lift a 50-pound wheel with one hand? There is no way I can pick that up with one hand, not, not above there. I'm not a strong man, I don't need to weight training. But when it's spinning, it's another matter. Release it, and it begins to climb almost on its own. No strain on my arm at all. There must be some trick. It was what people said. Whereas, in fact, I knew that once you got this thing processing, it appeared to float. It did appear to lose weight. And, if I and it was this idea that a gyroscope might lose weight that Lathwaite developed in his last experiment, one which was far too heretical for his audience and proved his final undoing. So if the big wheel lost weight, the question is, will these little wheels lose weight? when they're turned round and made to precess upwards, just like the big wheel. Let's try. Now, each time the wheel comes down the wall, you see the needle kick back. It appears to give a lot of weight, as with the big wheel. Although... We Nathwaite genuinely thought he was opening up a brand new area of research and that as Britain's most famous engineer, he would be taken seriously. Which you could use this lot of weight. This is certainly the most exciting experiment. I was simply trying to tell them that, look, here's no good. something very unusual that's worth investigating. No I hope I've got sufficient reputation in electrical engineering not to be written off as a crank. So when I tell you this, I hope you'll listen. But they didn't want to. I don't think we've hardly begun. After the R.I. lecture, all hell let loose, and, and primarily as a result, first of all, of an article in the New Scientist, which was followed by articles in the Daily Press, with headlines such as, Lathwaite defies Newton. And um, the press is always excited by the possibility of an anti-gravity machine, because of spaceships and science fiction. And the minute you say you can make something rise against gravity, then you've made an anti-gravity machine. And then the floodgates are unleashed on you, especially from the establishment. You've, you've now brought the, the science into disrepute, or you're apparently trying to, because you've done something which is against the run of the tide. Such was the hostility that the Royal Institution, for the only time in its history, didn't publish the discourse. As if they were trying to pretend Lathwaite had never given it. It hadn't happened. Even today, 20 years later, None of his eminent colleagues will publicly talk about that evening, or indeed, about Lathwaite himself. After the discourse that never was, Lathwaite was banished from the scientific establishment. He ought, on the basis of all the work he had done before with electrical machines, he ought to have become a member of the Fellowship of Engineering, perhaps a Fellow of the Royal Society. And I understand that he was nominated for these honours, though because of this incident, the nominations were blocked, and he was never given those honours. 
Richard Milton is an electrical engineer and science writer who's made a special study of the phenomenon of scientific heresy. Historically, it's, uh, it seems to be almost an integral part of the, uh, of the scientific process because uh, many of the famous names of the past, heroes of science, in fact, like Faraday and the Wright brothers, people like Edison, they were all in their day ostracized and ridiculed um, because their contemporaries were unable to see that what they were doing was an advance in science. They perceived it as being dabbling in some kind of occult or taboo subject. There have always been eccentrics in the history of science. There have always been Eric Lathwaite's, and they've always been derided and marginalised. But I think in the last 10, 20 years, the process seems to have accelerated. It's become worse and worse as science has become more institutionalised, more bureaucratic. It's become pub almost entirely publicly funded. Uh, the sort of sanctions which institutional science is able to bring to bear on the eccentric um, have multiplied and today if you don't toe the line if you uh, uh, and you don't have to uh, make a radically new discovery you can be uh, you can be ostracized simply for thinking about it today Lathwaite no longer draws the crowds he's been marginalized but, according to most of his colleagues, for good reason. He left his own chosen subject, the field he understood, and drifted into uh, a wonderland of mechanical engineering where his instincts didn't work. The evidence for the output... For 15 years, he'd become a figurehead of novelty, and he wanted that to continue. And that, I think, is the driving force that led him on to do something different, something of world importance. But although the innovator, the genius, is always opposed by the dunderheads who don't understand things, even the genius must stop and say occasionally, am I a genius? Am I really doing something new? Or am I deluding myself into believing I'm a genius? And I feel that Eric fell into that second category. But despite everything, Lathwaite was convinced gyroscopes had some kind of unusual force. He searched through the records of patent applications and found scores of inventors had had the same idea, some even believing gyroscopes to be the secret behind flying saucers. People like amateur inventor Sandy Kidd. Working from his garage, Kidd claimed his anti-gravity device, although it couldn't take off, did lose a pound in weight. He showed it to the one scientist he knew would take it seriously. In the 1980s, Lathwaite was still a professor at Imperial College, where he kept up research on gyroscopes on the side. At the time, he thought Kidd had made a real breakthrough. There can't be any doubt. There it goes. There's a whole object that goes up. Scovell was another inventor consumed with the idea that gyroscopes could produce a new form of thrust unknown to physics. I feel that the establishment will not accept anything unless we've differentiated it twice. A retired government engineer, Scovell, together with Lathwaite, thought the new force would show up in the complex mathematics of the gyroscope. <laughs> A few scientists who specialize in gyroscopes soon put Lathwaite right. Many people have been fascinated by the behavior of spinning objects, including gyroscopes. Amongst these, of course, is Professor Lathwaite. And the suggestion has been that these phenomena do not comply with existing classical laws of physics. This is not the case. These equations have been known for 200 years, and proper use of these will in fact predict with a very high degree of accuracy all of these so-called magic phenomena that one witnesses uh, from demonstrations like spinning wheels being lifted easily and apparent levitation. Indeed, when Sandy Kidd's device was independently tested and its weight properly measured, there was no levitation at all. Lathwaite almost gave up.
<laughs> the most depressing time was when I discovered there were no forces to be had from gyroscopes. They don't deal in force. The people who take out patents, like Sandy Kidd and so on, were misguided. The mathematics said there were no forces, and that was correct. The thing that wouldn't go away was, I asked myself, can you lift a 50-pound wheel with one hand, or can't you? And is it a smooth motion, or is not, you're not jerking it? No, it's a smooth. And does the spinning top on the board not jar out about its mass centre? That's right, it doesn't. Of all the critics that I showed lifting the big wheel, none of them ever tried to explain it to me. So I decided I had to follow Faraday's example and do the experiments. And so, after retiring from Imperial College, Lathwaite started experimenting in earnest. Sussex University offered him a laboratory, and he was partnered and funded by a fellow enthusiast, engineer and inventor Bill Dawson. Standing on a weighing platform, Lathwaite again tried lifting the spinning 20-kilogram wheel. if his sense that the wheel had lost weight was real or imaginary. Yeah, that's not bad. No, very good. That, that's where the original initial lift, and then that's where it feels like when it's around the back of the neck. There's no doubt about the actual loss. No, that's about the weight loss. No, no, there, no. Not at all. Lathwaite and Dawson have spent the last three years deep in research. The first thing we're trying to find out was how we could lift a 50-pound wheel with one hand. So we set out to try to reproduce this as a hands-off experiment. And we'd almost reproduced the effects we had with the big wheel, and we could get lift. Oh, yes. OK, try another side. Then we tackled the problem of lack of centrifugal force. And indeed, the experiments were telling us that there was less centrifugal force than there should be. Well, of course, I was trying to do the theory, of course. I was still trying to do the mathematics. We devised more and more sophisticated experiments until, not long ago, we cracked it. Okay, camera running. Gyroscopes okay. precessing in tandem around a pivot. Okay, to start. For Lathwaite, this was the Eureka experiment. Two, zero, two, three, four, five. The real breakthrough came when we realized that a precessing gyroscope okay, could move mass through space. The spinning top showed us that all the time but we couldn't see it. To zero. If the gyroscope does not produce the full amount of centrifugal force on its pivot in the center, Two. then indeed you have produced mass transfer. Three squares. 38 to the halfway yeah. point is three squares. Can I continue? Yep. It was more exciting than ever now because I could then now explain the unexplainable. Gyroscopes behave absolutely in accordance with Newton's laws. We were now not challenging any sacred laws at all. We were sticking strictly to the rules that everyone would approve of, but getting the same result, a force through space without a rocket. to look at this. I've had this revolutionary idea for a new kind of propulsion device. Last winter, Lathwaite took to a patent lawyer an idea in Meccano for a completely new system of locomotion, mass transfer by gyroscope. And what you're trying to do is to get this wheel, as it were, from here to there by precessing then get it back from there to there by sliding. But to do it as a continuous process. Right. But at the, the crux of it is, is this precession of the gyroscope to move the mass. And That's right. And that is a, a, a completely new discovery. Right? That is what we discovered. Right. And where do you see the principal application for this device? Well, the first thought, of course, is space propulsion, because mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't use a rocket. Right. 
But of course, if the bar weight ratio was high, then there'd be all manner of other applications, if you, especially if you could make it hover like a, a helicopter without any use of air in order to do it. To be a scientific heretic really takes a lot of strength. I suppose you could say, does it matter if science ridicules and ostracizes a person who doesn't play by the rules? But I think it does matter. I think it matters to all of us because practically every major advance in technology in the last hundred years has been some kind of defiance of the rules. But this derision, this uh, perception of the research being without value, without merit, that alone can be enough to kill off promising lines of research. Um, the worrying thing about this is that when you look back at the history of science, it isn't those on the inside that produce the innovations, it's those on the outside, it's the Eric Laithwaite of this world, the people who are perceived as the eccentrics that produce the invention. But science has a dilemma. Can it really be open to everything and explore every new idea, however unlikely? On the other hand, science is about innovation, and by definition, the more innovative an idea, the more challenging to existing theories, and therefore the more unlikely. So when the innovations are so great they become heresies, before testing the strength of the new ideas, science will test the strength of the heretics themselves. The qualities you need to be a heretic, undoubtedly, tenacity, I think, is the first one. If you believe you're right, you have to have the courage to go on. You, you can't just pretend, oh, well, I, I'll, I'll play to their tune and, and I'll, I'll get what honours are coming to me because I, I did linear motions and I'll be satisfied with that. It wasn't like that. It was rather like the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. If you've seen a white rabbit take a watch out of its pocket, you're going to follow it. It's like pretending it's otherwise. I'd have done this anyway, whether I'd been, had a reputation in engineering or not. It was the curiosity that took me. But now, of course, it's got serious. Whether a heretic is a visionary or a crank is ultimately for science to decide. But has it got the balance right? Should persecution ever be the price of innovation? Why should people reject the idea of something new? Well, of course, they always have. You go back to Galileo, they were going to put him to death for not saying the Earth was the centre of the universe. And the matter of something Mark Twain once said, a crank is a crank only until he's been proved correct. So now I myself have demonstrated that I've been correct all along. Anyone seeing the experiments would know at once, if they knew their physics, that I've done what I said I can do and that I'm no longer a heretic. <laughs>